So we're blessed are the peacemakers today. This is week nine of our series on the Sermon on the Mount. This morning we'll be looking at the seventh beatitude, which again is blessed are the peacemakers. Peace and peacemakers, I think, is they're close to God's heart. The concept of peace is embedded within the biblical account, I think, from Genesis to Revelation. As a result, there's, there's no shortage of instruction on the concept of peace in Scripture, and no shortage of what, what I could say, what could be said and preached about, and we'll get, we'll get to some of that in a few minutes, but with today being Communion Sunday, um, I think it's best to plan for a two-week approach to grasping uh, this important message, uh, what Jesus conveys concerning our being peacemakers. So this will be a, a, a Blessed are the Peacemakers part one today and then next week we'll wrap it up. Unless you all want me to just go on for like an hour or so, right? So all right, that's what we're going to do. As I suggested early on in the series, we've been looking at the Beatitudes with the understanding that they are not a means. They are not a means by which one can somehow gain or earn their salvation. Rather, they are characteristics that identify those who are saved and those who are living out their salvation in Christ. Also, as we discussed, there's no percentage point or identifying marker within the Beatitudes by which we might suggest that, that who is saved or whose salvation remains questionable. Salvation is not, as I suggested a few weeks ago, like ivory soap, with, which is 99% pure but 1% questionable, right? Salvation in Christ is 100% grace, it's 100% efficient, and 100% gift of God in Jesus Christ. So there's no, no percentage points there. And yet, as Ryan mentioned last week when, in his message, we are people whose hearts are impure. Isn't that true? We don't, we don't, we're not able to, to even come close to the standard. We're people whose spirits are easily distracted and misled by our emotions and the things of this world around us. We're weak. And though in Christ we indeed remain poor in spirit, right? Even though we're in Christ, we indeed remain poor in spirit and prone to pride instead of meekness, prone to hunger and thirst for things that don't glorify God nor promote His righteousness. Right? Isn't that true? We, we cannot seem to live up to these standards at all. And that is why, of course, we need Jesus, right? That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need God's forgiveness. That's why we need God's peace. And as we'll look at uh, next week, we're also inclined towards division and squabbling amongst ourselves rather than purity, unity, and peace. If salvation were to be gained by us looking into this perfect mirror of God's righteous standards, there would be not a one of us that could stand. Isn't that true, right? But thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your love in sending Jesus Christ into this world not to condemn us, but to save us through him. All God has asked of us, all that he's asked, is that we acknowledge our sin and our weaknesses and surrender our attempts at self-governance of our lives. That's all that God is really asking. If we could simplify it, that's what it is. That we dismiss and even throw aside any attempts at having a righteousness of our own so that we might be able to come under the covering and the protection of the blood of Jesus. It's all there for us, that we might allow God to clothe us with his son's righteousness rather than our own pitiful attempts at self-justification. For as scripture says, we are really poor, blind, and naked, and we need to be clothed on high. All of that, all of that is available to us. So when we question our commitment to living out these principles and question, as we should, how well we're doing in this regard, we'll need to be satisfied by the confirmation process that Jesus gives us here in the Beatitudes that we talked about. Just the fact that we would hunger for righteousness, just the fact that we would admit some of these things is, is evidence of our salvation. It's evidence of our, our starting down the road with Jesus and and. and in a guarantee that he will care for us, protect us, and save us. We'll need to be satisfied with this confirmation process. We'll have to be content 
with slow and often painful progress in the spiritual principles that these seven Beatitudes offer. Now notice I mentioned seven Beatitudes rather than eight. Many scholars suggest the Beatitudes only contain seven characteristics, Christian characteristics, with the eighth Beatitude concerning persecution, less of a Christ-like characteristic of the heart and more of an outcome of living in a world where evil continues to have its grip. Does that make sense? And I agree with this view. Though there are godly benefits in suffering, persecution, persecution itself is less a transformational characteristic of the heart and more something that happens to us from the outside. Others persecute us. If that be true, and I believe it is, then the seven principles of the Beatitudes should be thought of as a whole unit or a complete set of instruction on how we're all to live out the Christian life. And as we know, the, the number seven is often used in Scripture to communicate completeness, wholeness, holiness. These seven Beatitudes then are, as Spurgeon and others have commented, the golden ladder rungs that we climb one by one towards God's righteousness in Christ. Never earning our salvation, never earning it, yet always making our very, very best effort by God's grace to be transformed into the image of Christ himself. If this be true, then this is the yoke of teaching that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 11 when he said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, give you rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, we might have some reservations concerning this idea of the Beatitudes being easy and light, right? And they don't seem that way, do they? Seem pretty, pretty difficult to me. But in truth, right, and we, they only seem difficult to us. Well, they only seem hard to us because we've not yet allowed Jesus full reign over our lives. We haven't let him have full reign over our hearts. That's why we struggle. And thus we continue to take portions of that load upon ourselves that we need to cast upon Jesus. It isn't ours to carry. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children, as the ESV translates, sons of God. So we'll be called children or sons of God. Notice that Jesus speaks of, of who are those who are blessed, that they're not necessarily those who experience God's peace, but those who are blessed are the peacemakers. This is likely because peace is something, as Hebrews 12, 14 tells us, that we must pursue. We must be willing to pursue it, along with holiness, if we are to see God. That's what it says in Hebrews 12, 14. Clearly, in order to become a peacemaker, it requires dedication to others, not to ourselves. Get outside of ourselves, dedication to others commitment, and even hard work to bring about God's peace or to bring God's peace into difficult situations. We, let's face it, we live in a world of unbelief, strife, and disunity. And if peace is to be won in any situation, it must be won in the midst of trouble and adver adversity because that's where we live. Peace, born out of struggle and adversity, may seem like a foreign concept to most of us. But the peace Jesus came to bring was won only through the violence of the cross. That's a strange concept to put peace and violence in the same sentence. Jesus spoke of his peace as a sword, for instance, that would divide, causing family to struggle and hatred to arise. This is not your typical peace. Not the response that we, we might expect from peace persecution. We'll talk a bit more about this next week, but consider that video we just watched, right? Those brothers and sisters in Egypt, brothers and sisters in Christ that are hated for their belief in Jesus Christ and nothing more. And they are greatly persecuted. Not like we are here in the United States, you know, every once in a while someone makes fun of us or something. You know what I mean? This woman's talking about her husband and her son dragged out and killed before her while she's probably beaten. 
simply because they love and affirm their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Consider the words of Simeon in Luke 1 as he prophesied over the infant Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This child, he said, is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, right, from an infant. This is from an, his infancy. His peace bringing into the world is, among, is, is, is against adversity. And a sword was destined to pierce his mother Mary's heart as well. These are not words ordinarily associated with peace, yet this was the path our Prince of Peace chose to fulfill the angelic proclamation of peace on earth, right? So peace on earth will not come without adversity and struggle and some very, very difficult things that are going to happen here in this world and, and likely in our own lives. Notice Jesus uses the term peacemaker and not something more passive like peace bringer, you know what I mean, or, or, or I don't know. Uh, surely we're called to live in a peaceable, humble, and gentle life. Obviously, that's a good example of what our lifestyle should be. It's important to our witness, no doubt. And yet, as peacemakers, we're also called into this ongoing battle between good and evil. Despite our best efforts to live at peace with one another, conflict is unavoidable. But it's how we deal with that conflict that ultimately counts and makes all the difference in the church and to the world. How we deal with conflict. And the Greek word peacemaker is used only one time, one time, by Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually made up of two Greek words. The first is the typical Greek noun for peace, which is arene, which is the Hebrew equivalent of shalom. We'll look at that in a moment, but it is the second word that Jesus adds, poieo, that makes it unique. See, poieo is a verb, and it is an action term. Its meaning is always to do, to make happen, to cause, or to bring about, etc. So in combining the noun and the verb, the two words become an adjective. They work together to describe one who works to make peace happen. Clearly, it's an action word, and therefore an action concept, and not a passive one. Peace is never won by inaction or avoidance. Yet we often avoid difficult conversation and confrontation, don't we? Right? We don't. Especially in the church we do this. We avoid them because they don't feel very peaceful. They don't feel very nice. And yet when we leave trouble brewing and festering beneath the surface, it never seems to be able to go away on its own. No, it's, it almost always boils to the surface and eventually spreads like cancer into a, a greater trouble and a greater disunity. Seeking to live in peace with one another is not a matter of avoiding conflict. Rather, it's a matter of embracing it head on in love, speaking the truth in love. It's a matter of willingness to head directly into the eye of the storm, difficult conflicts and stormy emotions for love and for peace's sake. It's often through struggle and active rather than passive action that true peace comes about, that true peace is made. See, the road for the peacemaker can be a hard road indeed. It's one where we can be hurt and we can struggle and all the more we need to forget about ourselves in a sense and, and make peace for others' sake. It's a matter of willingness to Again, to head directly into the storm. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children, or again, as the ESV translates, sons of God. Did you notice the word called there, underlined uh, in, the, in, in that verse? First century Hebrew was not rich in descriptive adjectives to make up for that certain phrases or sayings or coined to give emphasis. For instance, a joy-filled man might be referred to as a son of joy. Or, or was it the case with James and John? They became known as the sons of thunder. So this is, this is a phrase that was well known to these people. Or in Acts 4.36, when we first, in, uh, first introduced to Barnabas, we discover his name means what? Anybody know? 
Sodom encouragement. But did you notice that Barnabas, his actual name was Joseph? In Acts 4.36, we learned that it was not his parents, but the apostles who named Joseph of Cyprus Barnabas. Calling him Barnabas, a son of encouragement, wasn't drawing attention to his gender or his family lineage. Rather, it was a significant means to, to draw attention to his obvious gifting and his, this primary characteristic of his personality. Thus describing Barnabas as someone who had the gift of encouragement and used it to encourage others often. It is very likely, very likely, considering the way Jesus combines these two terms as one in a unique way and connoting the action of a peacemaker that he's doing much the same as the apostles did with Barnabas. Jesus is suggesting when he says we'll be called sons of God that those who do the work of peacemaking will not only be blessed but will also become known for it. They'll become known for it. Like Barnabas was known as a son of encouragement. And in doing so, they will become, again, as the ESV translates, sons of God, who, like God, make peace in the midst of a difficult and rebellious world. Again, like Barnabas, the phrase is meant to draw attention to the godly characteristics and the diligence necessary to be a peacemaker. It's not an easy thing. Perhaps this verse could be better understood to mean, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be recognized for their godlike work and for, for making peace. I think that that's, that's a good way to look at it. And I think it's relevant that we grasp this uh, in this phrase because, because child or son of God, that, those terms may move us back towards the discussion of works and salvation, right? Because if I'm a child of God or, 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 or son of God, it, it sort of reflects on my salvation, doesn't it? But Jesus is not suggesting that in order to be a, a child of God, one needs also to be acti actively engaged in peacemaking like as if we would earn that. Rather, as with the case with all the Beatitudes, right? Being a peacemaker is a characteristic of one who is truly saved and will be blessed in the process of doing the will of God and in conforming to the image of Christ, uh, the spirit of Jesus, the master peacemaker who lives inside of us, right? So it's, again, it's an outflow of our salvation. So what is peace? It has multitude of meanings in English as well as in Greek. So I think we need to define what Jesus has in mind here. Is he talking about a day at the beach, uh, laying in a nap in a hammock, uh, listening to a river run by? I mean, those are, those are peaceful things. Is that what Jesus has in mind? Like many of the Beatitudes, we need to grapple with the words Jesus speaks in order to gain the best understanding that we can of, of his intended meaning. Not only in the culture of his day, but for those like us that now read his words centuries later, we have to grapple and understand clearly what it is Jesus is, is saying to us, especially if we consider the seven Beatitudes sort of a, his yoke of teaching. Very important we grasp it correctly. So what is peace and how can I become a peacemaker? How can you become a peacemaker? Well, first let's look at defining peace as we see it in Scripture. I see three distinct streams of peace throughout throughout the Bible. There, there, there could be more, but I'm, I'm trying to narrow it down a little bit. Peace with God is the first one. Peace within ourselves and peace with one another, which includes, right, includes peace in our homes and in our communities. Peace within the church, the body of Christ, and the much broader hope of peace in our nation and peace on earth. Okay, so that's, the Bible covers those things in a, in a, at a high level. In general, I think we're better off starting out with coming to an understanding of the Hebrew word shalom, because that's, that's in that crowd that day, the people were likely almost all Hebrew people, Hebrew mindset. Jesus didn't speak in Greek, so we can be assured he used the Hebrew words or Aramaic words or something equivalent to shalom when he spoke to the crowd. That being the case, let's start with a general understanding of what shalom meant to a first century Jew. According to William Barclay, shalom never meant only the absence of trouble or unrest. In biblical Hebrew, peace always meant everything which makes for a person's highest good. Think about that. Everything which makes for a person's highest good. 
We, we might think about love that way, right? If I love someone, I, I, I try to work towards everything that would make for their highest good, right? So peace is very, in that, in that regard, it's very close to loving. In ancient Israel, when people greeted each other with the word shalom, they were not simply saying hi or bye or wishing one another the absence of trouble, but instead they were actually speaking a mini blessing of sorts, right? over that person, that all of God's goodness would come upon them, would come upon their family. Strong's Concordance defines the Hebrew word shalom this way, completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, and harmony. That's a, that's a broad span, isn't it? But that's how it's used in the Bible. So it's, it's a big word, if we could say that, with lots of meanings. Uh, it's very deep. So as you can see, it's, again, broad. Uh, biblical shalom is much greater than simply wishing another smooth sailing or, or lack of trouble. It's a much deeper, more encompassing thing. In the Bible, shalom means not only freedom from all trouble, but as Barclay also points out, it means enjoyment of all good. I want you to, in, in order to, to wish someone peace, to bring, make peace in someone's life, is to help them to enjoy all that is good that God has provided. Shalom speaks of a community at peace. Biblical shalom incorporates a sense of wholeness and wellness, not only for the individual, but for our families and for our community and for our nation as a whole. All of which hinged upon having shalom or peace with God. So in general, shalom touches upon all these streams of peace that I mentioned. And we're not going to have time this morning to go over each of these three streams. So I'm, I'm just going to choose one. I'm just going to stay with one. And this is the first and primary uh, one. And we'll talk about the rest next week. The first and primary one is peace with God. Peace with God. This is where it all starts for us as Christians. If we're living in enmity with God, how can we have peace? within ourselves or within the wider circle of family, the church or community, none of that is available to us. Peace is an attribute of God. It's part of who he is. God is referred to as the God of peace. Jesus is referred to as the Prince of Peace. But that peace can never be realized or experienced until peace with God is received. Perhaps there are some here today here in the sanctuary or online, who have never entered into God's peace in Christ. We want to give you that opportunity this morning and pray that you'll receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord. The noun shalom points to, as I suggested, peace in the context of community, health, and wholeness. Whereas the verb form, shalom, points to a process or a movement towards its fullness. So the noun is always a static thing, the verb is always an action and a moving thing. Strong lists the rendering of the verb shalom as to make amends, to make good, to be or to make peace even, or to restore peace. So sh shalom is enjoying that, wishing that, blessing people with that, Shalom is working to bring it about. The wholeness of Shalom brought through God's justice and truth inspired the hope and expectation that the Messiah to come would restore Israel by ruling over it as their Sar Shalom, their Prince of Peace. Coincidentally, the root Shalom is found in the name of the city of Jerusalem. It's thought to mean foundation of or city of Shalom, city of peace. Another related aspect of shalom is seen in the Arabic root, salam. Again, all these, they just sound different, but they're, they're, different, uh, they're different streams of the same word. And of course, we know Jesus spoke in Aramaic. And salam means to be safe or to secure. And interesting enough, it means also to be forgiven. How about that? The Hebrew verb form was often used in a similar way. When a person had caused another to become deficient in some way, such as a loss of livestock or, or, or was his or her responsibility to restore what had been taken, lost, or stolen. 
In this context, the verb shalom literally means to restore, to restore. It's entirely possible. I don't know this for sure, but it's entirely possible. Jesus certainly didn't speak Greek, right? So it's entirely possible that Jesus used this actual word or a similar one as he spoke the beatitude to the crowd that day on the mount. This is how one would become a peacemaker. Surely these concepts are similar, if not almost identical. That's why I say that, right? I don't know, but seems reasonable. Concerning Christ in the light of his role as Messiah and Savior, these Hebrew concepts, I think they add, they add depth and an entirely new layer to what peace with God is all about. The meaning of this related verb shalom could be just as easily translated, it was paid for. Or better still, its cognate form, meshulam, which means it was paid for in advance. How about that for us? Paid for in advance. These words connect us, I think, instantly to the death and resurrection of, uh, death and sacrifice, rather, of Jesus on the cross that would make our peace and our shalom possible, right? It was paid for us well in advance. There's a Jewish, Jewish saying, once it's paid for, then there's peace. Meaning that until a debt is settled between two people, there's eh, sort of unrest. An alternative way of stating that same thing is peace has a price. Peace always, in this world, peace always has a price that has to be paid. In Christ, our debt was completely paid through his wounds. We are healed. And the peace between us and God, he has established, it has been established forever, forever. Surely our deficient accounts were covered in full. And we could not do anything about it. We were helpless in our sin. We were helpless in our brokenness. Our best efforts were like filthy rags before God. We had nothing we could offer. We couldn't even get on the first rung of the ladder. And in truth, that is why the table is set before us here this morning. It's set to remind us that through our sinful ways, we accumulated such a debt that we could never pay. And when we were yet estranged from God, and without hope or peace in this world, our debt was paid not only in full, it was paid in advance. He paid the cost for our restoration. As the hymn writer penned, Jesus paid it all. He was our shalom, our restorer. He was our meshulam who paid the price of redemption in advance for all of us so that we might enter freely into the courts of his grace. He paid the price for our sin and rebellion long before we were ever born or even thought of so that we might experience his peace and his shalom for all of eternity. Isn't that glorious? That is awesome. Let us move on then to the table of God's salvation and peace. Those of you at home, I, hopefully you have gathered elements of bread and drink so that you might join us in this greatest of all celebrations. Please don't stress out if you have not prepared in advance. God can make whatever you have there holy unto himself. Perhaps for some of you, this will be your first time taking communion with a true or a new understanding of the why and, and what it's all about. Let's pray that God will bless the table here as well as the table in your home with the sweetness of his presence. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your words on the mount that have come down to us through the centuries. Ancient as they are, they're as relevant today as the day they, they left your lips. And we thank you, Jesus, and we honor you, and we, we turn to you as our master teacher, our rabbi, our savior, our God and our friend. My goodness, the list goes on of all you are to us. Our lover, our redeemer, the restorer of broken hearts. Lord, and it is this table that represents your gift to us, your death on the cross that shattered forever the power of evil in this world. Even though we live in the, in the now and the not yet, of the fullness of what you've done. We believe in faith, Lord, that you have shattered the enemy. We have broken his power. 
and you. We turn to you for all that we need. What I just ask as we come to the table that we, we all just take a few moments. Um, as Brendan plays a little bit, and um, Lord, we just think about the past sins that we still feel guilty about or struggle with, Lord. Things that have happened this week or recently that we regret. And above all, the sweetness of who you are. That you would willingly give up your life for us so that we could experience these, these sins, these regrets, these consequences even of things that we have done in our rebellion that you, by your word, tell us have removed as far as the east is to the west. They are no more. You purposely remember them no more. Lord, and I pray and ask that you would fill us in such a way with that, to be able to grasp that understanding, to communicate that to others, Lord. There are so many people in the world who think of you as getting even with them or punishing them for things that they did a long time ago. And yet your word tells us none of that is true. And this table affirms your intention to remove our sins as far as the east is to the west. And so in peace, peace with you, we come this morning to the table. And let us now, Lord, just for a few minutes, Holy Spirit, come indwell indwell us, remind us, bring to the surface wounds and hurts and things that, that we should raise up to confess or to let go, to let go in the name of Jesus. Amen.